Welcome to season five of the Color Success Podcast, where we talk with guests from AAPI and ethnic minority communities and have real discussions about mental health and what success looks like. I'm your host, Dr. Stephanie J. Wong. Before we get into it, remember to subscribe to our mailing list for free at colorsuccesspodcast.com so you don't miss any updates. There, you will find our socials, YouTube channel, and all episodes on streaming platforms for great additional content. Rachel Ming Brown is the CEO and founder of Gen Agency, awarded NYC 20 in their 20s in entrepreneurship and sports by Crane's New York business in 2021. Rachel is a former Big Ten collegiate athlete, official TikTok partner, and front office sports staff member. She has partnered with brands like Amazon, TurboTax, Netflix, and Meta, and worked in the front offices of the New York Mets, Rutgers football, main events for boxing, the PGA Tour, and U.S. Rowing, Team USA. Instagram is at Rachel Mang. Rachel, thank you so much for joining me today on the show. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's such a amazing, interesting story when your PR reached out to me. And so could you tell me a little bit about your professional and athletic career and then moving towards starting this new endeavor? Yeah, yeah. So um, I am currently the founder of Gen Agency. We're an influencer marketing agency. We do everything from one-to-one influencer managing of their brand deals. We do full-scale marketing campaigns. We do the ideation and production of influencer events. And we also have our new NIL education program called Athletes Turn Creators. Um, I am also a college former athlete. Um, Mm -hmm. I was a student athlete at Rutgers in the Big Ten. uh, And I also had a short but long history uh, in pro sports as well. So my whole background has kind of been in the sports and media space. Um, And that was really like what I did pre-COVID. I was working with different influencers and athletes in the space, um, like US Rowing with Team USA, PGA Tour, uh, New York Mets, main events boxing. Um, But, you know, even while I was doing those things, my goal was to always end up starting a company in the sports and media space. Um, and I always knew that I wanted to be more in like the marketing side. So I always knew that eventually I was going to have to work with uh, influencers and celebrities because they're obviously the ones that uh, know the best. Um But then COVID happened and lockdown really forced a lot of people to be stuck at home, uh, be on their phones. And that was really when like social media, TikTok, uh, influencer marketing was really on the rise. Um, And that was something that I noticed early on. Um, And from there, I was actually working with a lot of different companies, a lot of different people in the social media space and branding. Um, But eventually I was hired by TikTok as an official learn on TikTok partner where I actually met a lot of different creators. I got to help transform the platform from like that dancing fun uh, like version that we (laughs) saw before. Yeah. Um, Into like the DIY and education and still like really lighthearted version that you see now. Um, And it was really cool because I got to work alongside TikTok and be part of their community group, but actually met a lot of creators, which is actually how our agency started. Um, I originally had a couple other co-founders. They were influencers and activists. um, And we all banded together and started Gen Agency. Um, And so now today, I am the sole owner of the agency. I absorb the shares from the rest of our founders. Um, And then we recently started our Athletes Turned Creators um, program, which is our NIL program really to help uh, student athletes because of this whole like NIL education industry space, um, learn how to become an influencer, learn what influencer marketing is, and really like understand the whole like knowledge and expertise that the influencers and celebrities have, and really bring it over to this athlete side. So uh, from what I was, you know, what I always wanted to do pre-COVID and even just like in my career, um, it's really cool to have been like full circle and find myself here now. And for those that don't know, NIL is name, image, and likeness. And in the past, uh, college athletes weren't able to capitalize Mm -hmm. on their NIL. And so this is a really new emerging space. And so how do you choose which athletes to work with and in what sports uh, types are you working in? 
I guess like from an influencer standpoint, you know, it's kind of the same that we look for with them. We're always looking for people who are really self-motivated, who are really like career driven and proactive. Um, the reason is because, you know, we want to work with people that want to work with us, want to grow their career and do better. Um, so we're always looking for athletes that are really interested in not only like becoming, you know, a social media influencer and going viral, but learning about monetizing their social media, learning about creating really good content and working with cool brands and potentially potentially even creating a career for themselves after college. Um, mm -hmm. And the colleges that we work with are uh, colleges across the country. We also do have a really big HBCU push because we're partnered with HBCU Heroes. So we uh, we do a lot of things with HBCUs as well. Where do you see this market going? Because I'm, I'm sure you're like you have your pulse on the trends and people really do want to be able to create this income because, you know, if you get injured, knock on wood for a lot of these athletes, they feel like it's over. Yeah, I think it's it's so cool that this is a thing now. Um, because when I was a student athlete, we didn't have NIL, but we definitely understood, you know, that our name, image, and likeness was being used by the colleges. We were on the tickets, we were on the marketing, we we're in all of that. Um, and during my time as a um staffer in pro sports, like I saw all the time with the Mets, with boxing. Um, so I had a good understanding of it. And I think that a lot of people, just in a general sense, do understand what this is about. But I think what they don't understand is that like student athletes the real reason why we have this rule is so that athletes can now like take advantage of this monetization. Like they can use their likeness as a student athlete, as an athlete at X school, or even just like the fame that they've gotten from being on like a really national scale from their schools to monetize and to make money. Um, and I think that as that gets built out, you know, there's goods and bads. Uh, the good thing is that athletes are, you know, becoming influencers. They are learning so much about the marketing space that it's changing like their outlook. It's changing what careers they can possibly go into. Mm -hmm. um, I think on a not great side, uh, as you know, there's always goods and bads. Uh, I think that the side um, of like the entity, like these businesses, these collectives, um, these organizations that are really like managing these athletes, these lawyers, agents, whatever it might be, they're still kind of taking advantage of athletes. Um, you know, they're still using them and marketing out their likeness to make money. Like these organizations are still really focused on ROI. Um, and that a lot of times means that a lot of other athletes that aren't like the top money-making athletes aren't going to get the education, aren't going to get the marketability, aren't going to get like any of the benefits that these huge athletes are getting. So um, that's kind of where we come in with our program because like we're focused on education and consulting these programs only. Like we're not in it for the money. We are not receiving any compensation from the athletes from any of their deals. Like we're purely just educating them. So we're hoping that that becomes a trend um, in the space. That's definitely one of our goals. Yeah, I was going to ask about the athletes that are like mid or just yeah. not at that like, oh, you're going to be the number one draft pick, right? Um, just to empower them to share their experiences and be able to make a little bit of, of money. Yeah, it's really crazy, you know, because I think, like I said, like so many of these companies, these collectives, these managers, these agents, like they're focused on their ROI and the company ROI, which is like business. Um, but there are so many of those athletes, like a university like Ohio State has a thousand student athletes, and there may only be like 10 that are top tier, but everyone else is still a phenomenal athlete, like still sure. is a great person, has a whole story behind them. And like they could build their own social media, become an influencer and be getting like, you know, anywhere between like $500 up to like $20,000, depending on their like social media size per post. Um, so like they really have this opportunity. I think that it's really, you know, our goal to get our education and the expertise and the knowledge that we got from working with influencers about how to go viral, about how to work with brands, like how to keep track of all your business and things like that to these like mid-level and small athletes. Because again, like they're the ones that aren't being educated, the ones that aren't really being helped. Yeah. And I think it sounds like it's a blanket too. I mean, you obviously tailor your approach to athletes, but that content creators can really benefit from a lot of the core principles that you've been a already able to build out. So, I mean, how do you make money then? Because you said you're not getting any kickback from the deal. So what, what is your monetization look like? Yeah, yeah. So we actually charge the schools that we work with, the collectives, any of the businesses, um, we charge them a fee for our services because what they're getting is like all of our education programs, our mm -hmm. workshop, our courses, like our time, our 
office hours dedicated to their students, dedicated to their athletes, um, and even their staff, because I think this is a space where a lot of people maybe don't understand like what influencer marketing is, but they're an agent in the NFL space or they're a lawyer in the NFL space, but there's still like that gap because collectives and um, like NIL, like this whole space really is just influencer marketing for athletes. So right. we still provide the athletes like their education, but we also help all the collectives and the businesses like understand how to really get like the most bang for their buck out of it. Right. So shifting gears a teeny bit at the intersection of mental health, because that's obviously a huge part of our show is how do athletes, including yourself, manage their mental health when they have all these things going on? They have to go to school, they have to you know, they have to practice, play, perform. And obviously, if they want to get to the next level, we can talk about that next. Yeah, I think um, for me personally, this is really when I realized it. Um, during like our first year of the company, uh, back in 2021, we actually had a huge influencer house. It was fully sponsored. It was in Austin, Texas. Um, 11 creators living in a house for eight days. Wow, um, sounds was, like the real world. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was very interesting. Um, it was really fun, though. It was really cool. We, um, we're also in the middle of filming a documentary, which is launching at South by Southwest um, in March. So that was really cool as well. But it was just so much going on that I actually... Actually, um, ended up in the hospital just from stress. Um, and I almost went into sepsis. So I literally almost worked myself to death. Um, and it was really at that point that I learned that something that's really important with mental health and being like this high achieving person, entrepreneur, athlete is like your ability to compartmentalize. And I think that a lot of times people think that compartmentalizing can be bad, but I think in the sense of mental health and like having to perform at such a high level all the time, especially for athletes, like you really need to, um, you know, you have your job, you have your sports career and for student athletes, like they have their, um, sport. They also have like their influencer career, like NIL, all of that. And I think that putting them all into boxes and working really hard at like each box that you have when you're dedicating that time to it is probably the most important, um, really figuring out, you know, like you're going to work at this box, this career, this area at the time that you've set aside for it and just focusing on that. I think that's really important. And even for myself, it's been <laughs> definitely something that I had to learn. Um, but even now, I think as you know, I go forward and as like these athletes go forward, I think that mental health is definitely something that's been like a hot topic. It's been something that we're all a lot more um, comfortable talking about, even in like being a POC. Like, I think it's something that we're even more comfortable talking about as well. And I think that going forward, um, athletes and people should just know, like, if you're going through something, like you always have a community who is either going through the same thing as you, or they're there to support you. And it's really important for us to like lean on our community, our family and our advisors, um, because they're the people that will really like hold you up when you're falling down. I mean, really what you're talking about is prioritization, but I also want to emphasize that integration as a person is just so important while you compartmentalize all these roles it, from your strategy, you know, really being able to address these things. So what, what mental health resources are available in terms of professional or even peer to peer, um, in these different spaces? Yeah. Yeah. So I think, um, we're lucky that in the sports space, especially if you're a student athlete, um, there are a lot of resources, you know, like you have a team and then you have your coaches, your advisors, and then you have like the whole athlete community, you have the university and each one of those has different levels of um, like sports psychologists or like just even being able to talk to your teammates and vent, I think is so important. Like on a career level, your coworkers, the people you work with, like venting to them is definitely something that's helpful. Um, I think the influencer side though is really where it might be lacking um there are no like restrictions on what a manager can take for an influencer as like commission there are no like general you know like an nflpa like there's no overarching union that works to help these influencers so you're really relying on things like your peers other influencers um maybe your manager or your agency and then even more so um you know we're actually partnered with beacons.ai they're a link and bio tool and they have a community where uh, all the creators that use their link and bio tool can actually be part of that community talk to each other collaborate like even talk about brand deals and like that's a whole nother level of community that like they had to go find but like people that they can rely on and like really um kind of like vent about the things that are going on absolutely so thinking about 
your career? You mentioned you had a brief stint in, you know, pro sports and you can kind of elaborate more on, on what your, what your journey was at that point. Um, but is it a different mindset when you are at that level of performance and more people know you and trying to cope with the booze, the cheers, like there's just so much that's going on. How is your mindset maybe a little bit different than when you were playing college sports? Yeah. Um, I think even now, like there's always a sense of whether you're um, on this side of business, like influencer marketing, celebrities, like uh, <laughs> just like this public eye face. And even as an athlete, like same thing, like all of your constituents at your school know who you are, all of your um, like donors, all of your administrators, even like all of your fans. Um, and I was lucky enough to be a student athlete at Rutgers. And, you know, we had people who are fans of the university who knew who we are. Uh, I was lucky to work with the football team too. So when I mm -hmm. worked in the recruiting department, like I would see students come up to these recruits, like these 16, 17 year old kids and like be in their face with signs, like so excited to see them. And I think that having that, um, like being in the public eye and having that experience definitely helped me understand like nowadays what a lot of these influencers go through and even more so like what these athletes go through on a really high level. Um, and I think that it's something that is really important to talk about with these athletes because they don't really know what's coming for them and they don't really know like how to handle it per se. So again, like those mental health resources are important. Um, even on the athletes or on the influencer side, I think mm -hmm. that um, a lot of people get and there's a word for it too, uh, imposter syndrome, where like you're so just don't feel like you belong here. And I think that um, that's something that's come to fruition, but also like come into the conversation since influencer marketing started in the mental health space. And I think even as, you know, myself in this space, like I'm a product of intersectional diversity, like being a woman of color, being yep. young, um, I'm even adopted. So I have Caucasian parents. So there's like a lot of different things going on, but I think that's even put me in a space where where, um, you know, I'm different than the people that I'm working with. And I'm a lot different than the people I'm marketing to, um, you know, sitting in a room with other C-suite executives, talking to them. I think sometimes you can even get imposter syndrome there, just kind of almost being like shell shock that like you're there in the room talking, like you're on that public level where, you know, you're even doing podcasts and interviews. Um, I think all of that comes into account when you're talking about mental health and when you're talking about like being in the public eye. So how have you been able to navigate that intersectionality? Because that it's, it's a huge buzzword, right? But yeah. from, from the, when it was first brought up um, mm -hmm. in, in the um, psychological literature, it, it really was talking about not relying on the single axis approach to understanding people. And you've just mm -hmm. mentioned a number of factors that, <laughs> that make up your identity. Mm -hmm. So what was it like? How have you been able to navigate it as time has gone on? Yeah, I think it's been really interesting. I think every day it changes um, and every day how I see the world um, grows. I think that I was lucky that, you know, I am adopted. My parents are Caucasian. I grew up in a Caucasian dominated um community when high school and then a shell shock. I went to college and I went to Rutgers, which is very, very diverse. My team was diverse, all the other athletes diverse. And I think having that experience of the two worlds really kind of makes me what I am. Um, I think that it has helped me in a lot of ways, but it's also made me grow up and learn how to be in a lot of different situations with different people um, and still continue to be myself because I think that's a really big part of it is, you know, these different intersections of your diversity. Um, they do kind of not pigeonhole you, but they do represent a part of you. But I think that it doesn't mean that that's the only part of you. Um, so I think for myself, like I've always really tried to stay true to myself, no matter where I was, whether I was in a Zoom with other C-suite or, you know, I'm in a room talking to student athletes that are only years away from where I was. Right. Um, so I think that, you know, 95% of the time, not everyone is going to look like me, but I think being the same person, no matter where I am, has always been really important. And being an adoptee, how has that shaped your life? And can you speak a little bit about where you're adopted from and your parents and, and kind of your upbringing? 
Yeah. So I was adopted from South Korea. Um, I was, uh, it was before I was a year old. I spent a little extra time there in a foster home. And then I came over to the States. Um, I'm actually from upstate New York in Syracuse, which is uh, a relatively uh, small area. And, you know, I'm used to seeing feet of snow. So now I live in I was Los like, Angeles. it's cold up yeah, there. Yeah, it's really cold <laughs> up there. Um, I used to ski. I used to figure skate. So like all the snow sports, that was me. Um, <laughs> but now I live in Los Angeles and it's very different. Um, and I think, again, like just having that experience of being part of that like very, very um, Caucasian community, very safe community was so much different than the community that I was in at Rutgers. And even when I graduated and, you know, started this company, like I see a lot of diversity. And I think that my upbringing specifically was something that really contributed to the way that I'm able to like move through different groups of people and still be able to continue to be myself and continue to find success. Have you been able to connect to perhaps your cultural heritage and how have you been able to do that? Yeah, I think it's, for me, it's um, something that's always, I guess, a goal, Um, you know, because my parents are Caucasian and it's not something that we discussed a lot just because they don't have a lot of experience with uh, Korean or Filipina culture. And so as I grew up, like as I went to college, I started to understand more and branch out. And I think even in the last few years, it's definitely something that I've been doing. Um, you know, every year I go to a Lunar New Year festival, I've been able to connect with different restaurants, even different companies that are like Korean owned or um, POC owned, like we're able to connect over social media. Sometimes I help them out with marketing. Sometimes I uh, do post for them for UGC. So it's been really cool, like as I get older to better understand like myself and my heritage and where I fit in and where like those pieces can kind of fit into my life now. Absolutely. So I'm sure over time, as you mentioned, you're a young POC woman in this space. What does success look like to you? Yeah, I think um, for me, there was one time that one of my friends, um, she is another like woman of color. She's actually Asian. We met in college and she had told me that like she always had looked up to me and that she felt that to her, like I was a leader in not necessarily her field, but just someone that she knew that she felt it was because I was uh, Korean, because I was young, because she didn't see many other Asian women doing a lot of the things that I was doing. Um, and, you know, through research, I really realized that there aren't a lot of uh Uh, Asian women doing what I am doing, not only in marketing, but in sports and really that intersection of sports and marketing. Um, There really aren't. And especially being in such a niche area, like, you know, going one step further into influencers, one step further into NIL. um, I really haven't seen anyone like me. So I think for myself, um, I always want to be someone that leads by example. Uh, I do always want to um, be someone who's breaking barriers and continues to push forward for what may be younger you know, women of color or just like younger individuals in general may want to do or be in the future. Um, I think with our company specifically uh, for our program, Athletes Turn Creators, I want it to be in as many schools as possible, as many power schools as possible, and then um, at least touch on all 16 schools that we're working with, with the HBCUs. Um, And then on top of that, with our influencers, I really, uh, I want to be able to hit a million dollars this year in deals that we find for our creators, because that's a lot of what our business is. So um, it's going to be a busy year. (laughs) And it's already starting off amazing. So, I mean, it it sounds like you are really building this out and there's a lot of um, growth in this area. So thinking about the different athletes that you work with, how do you tailor your approach and pay homage to this intersectionality? Yeah, I think um, even first off, uh, you know, a lot of student athletes do tend to be people of color. So um, a lot of the athletes we work with, it is cool, I guess, that um, I can speak a lot of their language, like being young, being a former student athlete, being a person of color. um, It is something that differentiates us from a lot of the different programs in the NIL space. You know, a lot of them are headed up by agents, by like former finance people or like lawyers. And like, that's just not where we are. You know, we are um, a former influencer based, former student athlete uh, company that is coming to them and speaking to them on that level of an expertise that a lot of people don't have. 
And then additionally, um, our HBCU push, you know, we're partnered with HBCU heroes, like I said, and we actually have a 16 school HBCU career and financial literacy tour coming up, which is really cool because a lot of these HBCUs are schools that don't have the funding or don't have the ability to have this like NIL education, like schools like Duke University, they have a whole GM dedicated just to NIL, but these HBCUs, like they don't have people who are experts in the space coming back and talking to them or educating their athletes on how they can get involved, how they can make money. So um, it's been something that has been really important to myself and to us to be able to actually educate them and to be able to help them start their careers here. Yeah, not only that, managing money. So financial literacy is huge to me. And I think just in general, people don't really get that education in schools. It's like a one of the most needed. Like it's so common sense, it, but it's, it's just a needed not skill. <laughs> it's a, such a needed skill to be an adult. And I'm glad to see like my oldest daughter, she's actually getting word problems with stocks and stuff mm -hmm. like that at in elementary school. So I'm like, okay, I'm I'm down with that. Um, but what can people do? I mean, I know this is general to manage their money though, because it even if they're getting tons of brand deals and they're making all this money, people tend to say, okay, I'm making more money so I can spend more money. But what is a good rule of thumb in terms of managing, you know, expenses and savings and getting yourself through college? Yeah. Wow. That's, I mean, I think that hits on so many different levels between um, like general public, students, student athletes, aspiring students. Um, I think it really depends on your goals. And I think that, you know, <laughs> I hate to be that person in the influencer space, um, but there are a lot of creators out there and a lot of like educators and adults that are helping people by talking about these things, like talking about like the 50, 30, 20 rule, talking about, you know, what types of stocks do what, like how they mature, um, you know, where you can put your money in high yield savings accounts. Like there are so many people out there that have an expertise in those spaces and they're sharing this education across social media. And that's actually how our agency got started. Like we were pretty much financial influencers are based. Um, so I think if you're looking for advice, you can find a lot of really great creators that will talk about it. Um, a lot of them are like CPAs. A lot of them have like accreditation. So they are good people that you can work with. Um, I know with us, with Beacons, um, with the athletes that we work with, even the influencers that are accumulating these brand deals, like you need a book of business. Like you need to know where your money's coming in from, if you've been paid, W9s, 1099s, all of those things. Yep. And Beacons actually has like an invoicing portal that we use and we actually give to all of our student athletes as part of our Athletes Turn Creator program where they can actually see like a ledger of like what brand deals they've done, if they've received um, a 1099, like how much the money was for. So they can keep track of it too because I think even like this organization, um, I think that's really like the fundamental of what financial literacy really turns out to be. So I think there's a lot of different things that people can do. Um, and hopefully, you know, between our influencers and between our athlete program, like we're able to at least touch on that like first level. Well, and my big thing is generational wealth, right? When you start out and the system is not created equal, right? There's systemic mm -hmm. racism, all the isms. And so um, how do you feel like we can fight the system? It sounds so cliche, but how do we change the system to where we are making it and moving towards equality. Yeah, I think, you know, even in that sense, um, you do see a lot of that. Like when I work with um, a lot of like former finance people who are now running collectives or like finance people who are um, running the companies that I work with, like a lot of times they don't look like us. Um, a lot of times they are male and a lot of times they are white. And so it is something that you see every day. And I think that being inundated by the same type of people over and over again can be um, discouraging. But I think with that being said, like finding people in a community that are also looking for financial literacy are also looking to be better and surrounding yourself by those people. I think that's really important. Um, being able to see other people like you that also want to do the same thing. And I think that you know, as much as we'd like to say that we'd love every school in the country to teach financial literacy, at least at the high school level, um, that's not always something that's going to happen. And it would take a really long time. So I think that, you know, what we're trying to do is give this financial literacy, even on like a base level, and this just education to these HBCUs to really even out and democratize the space, um, even give it to other student athletes that are, you know, not the top athletes, but they're still like our mid and our smaller athletes to, again, like democratize the space. Um, 
And even going back to it, I think that a lot of content creators and just, you know, there's courses online. There are a lot of things online that unfortunately your school is probably not going to provide them for you, but there are free resources out there to be able to educate yourself on, you know, what to do with your money personally, where to invest it, what investing even is, like ways to become wealthy and even pass that wealth on to your uh, next generation. There's a lot of great creators out there, but I also want to touch upon, there's a lot of crap out there too. So, yeah. you know, especially in mental health, you know, everyone and their mom thinks that they're a therapist. <laughs> okay. Let's be yep. honest. Um, so how do you differentiate uh, who's credible and who's not? And how do you build credibility um, among your audience? Yeah, I think, um, you know, there are a lot of accreditations that you have to go through to become like a CPA or, you know, even in the mental health space, whatever it is, a lot of creators that have those accreditations and you can find out if they have them, if it's not listed on their page, it's also on another website. Um, understanding that is really important because, you know, there are a lot of finance stock people out there that may be like pump and dump schemes. Yeah. Um, and so they may always, be broke as a joke. <laughs> oh yeah. 100%. Um, there's always, you know, the public eye and then the private eye. Uh, but understanding that and then doing your research and due diligence on like the people that you're listening to, even like people in your family, like, do you really want to listen to your uncle that like has no money and is telling you to do like X, Y, Z, but like, he don't really know what's going on. Um, you always want to do your due diligence. But I think even in that sense, um, the creators, the influencers, the athletes, it's the ones that are talking about it. You know, we saw this huge scandal with FTX and like yes. other brands where people were doing, um, you know, they weren't really doing their research. And I think that that responsibility is on the athlete. It's on the influencer. If you are going to brand yourself as an ambassador or um, be a supporter of something, you need to look it up. You need to like know what the company is about. You need to know what they're doing. You need to understand the product. Um and I think even on that sense, like these athletes and these influencers that are talking about stocks or they're talking about their, um, you know, a high yield savings account that they like, I think it's important that they still continue to do their research. They still continue to like do their due diligence and even not mix brands that are the same, like Robin Hood and public. They're very similar, not mixing them when they suggest that their followers and even athletes too, like not mixing brands that are very similar and suggesting them through their followers at the same time um, or just because they're being paid. I think there's a lot of to do with authenticity when it comes to that. And I think that that's a really big part of people trusting you, um, even in like a real life sense as well. Mm -hmm. And choosing the, the brands that you actually resonate with and you would mm -hmm. use versus who's going to pay you. So where can folks connect with you and really learn more about your UGC program? Yeah. So they can find us at genagency.co. And then also my Instagram handle is Rachel Mang, M-A-E-N-G. Um, it has all of our contact information there. Thank you so much, Rachel, for being on the show. It I learned so much. I'm letting it all soak in for the NIL. And um, obviously, I'm in, in a creator space, even though I'm not an athlete. I used to play basketball, but okay. Well, you got, you got your own state. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Remember to support us for free by subscribing to our mailing list at colorsuccesspodcast.com. There, you will find our socials, YouTube channel, and all episodes on streaming platforms for great additional content. As Rob Heaps from Partner Track said, success is contagious, so come catch it.